a lot of people, when they talk about AI, they talk about artificial intelligence. And I think like in healthcare, we're just not ready to go there. There's just too much data, too much information, and it's, it's very disparate. You're not very well understood. You know, when you have a problem that's difficult to understand, it's complex, the data underneath it is in many ways deficient, then I don't think that artificial intelligence can really solve that problem. But what we do need in healthcare is we need that augmented data. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome listeners to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today we're talking with Nan McDonald. Nan is the Chief of Data Operations at the Institute for Augmented Intelligence in Medicine, where she is bridging computational methods with human experience to advance medical science and improve human health. Nan is a 2022 cohort candidate for the Women in Bio 3.8 initiative, named for the March 8th International Women's Day, where her team seeks to increase startup board leadership for women in Chicago's life sciences. Finally, if that isn't keeping her busy enough, she is a healthcare senior advisor at McCormick BI. Thank you, Nan, for all the work that you do to enable better healthcare by liberating data. Hi, Justin. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. Well, great. No, it's, it's really a treat to talk with you. We haven't had a whole lot of people on here that have really been focused like, like you have been really around healthcare, about all this data that we really have in healthcare. And I know one of the things you talk about is this kind of spread out in a number of different areas. And I really want to you know, get into that as, as we talk. But to sort of kick things off, I guess, maybe you could give a little bit of a background with regards to you know, sort of how you got into this chief of data operations role and, and some of the other organizations that you're a part of, sort of what was the path in, in your career? When I graduated from Northwestern, I had a communications degree. And the first job that was offered to me was in HR. And my reaction was, wow, somebody's going to pay me to talk to people all day. And so after that, uh, I spent some time in HR and got involved in PeopleSoft implementation, which is a HRIS system. And what I found is that in HR, a lot of what you're doing is answering questions about how do you translate business strategy into like people. When we implemented the system, it made it that much easier to answer questions. I decided then that I wasn't, as much as I liked people, I actually liked computers more. So I went back to school. And at that time, the whole area around business intelligence and data warehousing was just kicking off. Came out of school and was working in consulting, doing data warehouses, analytics, all that good stuff. And then I had started having kids and the whole travel with consulting was not as, you know, as fun as it used to be. Mm. And so I was offered a job, which I thought was going to be kind of a a small hiatus from consulting to work at this little known company called Blue Cross Blue Shield. So eight years later, you know, the ACA was passed and, you know, all of this healthcare data and sort of the need for data became more and more relevant. I've been sort of in and out of the both the insurance side of the healthcare industry, as well as the management consulting for the last, I would say, 15 or so years. How do those sides differ when it comes to insurance? And then you said management healthcare. What, what are we talking about here? Well, management consulting is just the Deloitte's and Accenture's of the world. I worked for um, more boutique companies. They tend to hire people who have a lot of experience to come in and help companies do their data strategies or their IT strategies or like how do you pivot from a regular SDLC to a more agile methodology. So, you know, definitely kind of that higher order thinking that people usually when they're in the thick of things have a hard time kind of pulling themselves out and looking at the big picture. So we kind of help them do that. I get it. And, you know, you talked about software development life cycles as like SDLC. Some people maybe not aren't familiar with that term. I've been doing that for many, many years myself. So it feels like you're kind of bringing agile into healthcare. Agile into healthcare, agile into data, just kind of realizing that actually, I think data warehousing is perfect for the agile framework because a lot of the impatience people had around a like sort of standard software development life cycle in data 
was that, you know, like data is ever changing and you're constantly having to bring it back up and look at it again. And so it marries better with Agile than it does with SDLC. So then, okay, so yeah, so you're, you're doing all this management consulting, I guess, right? Having, having a good time looking at data, but something changed because you're, you kind of got into, into Northwestern, right? Is that there's this different yeah. center that you're a part of right now that you're, you're leading? Right. You know, having spent all this time trying to create data solutions for health insurance companies, I uh, was sort of looking for, like right before the pandemic, looking for a rest you know, and doing something that was meaningful. You know, my whole mission is to liberate data in healthcare, working inside insurance companies where it tends to be very conservative. And so there's not, like innovation just takes a lot longer. And so I thought I'd take a break and go back to my alma mater and sort of volunteer my time. But at the time, the Institute for Augmented Intelligence and Medicine was just launching. And um, it's then instead become my full-time job as opposed to just kind of this volunteer six-month hiatus that I was planning to take. So it's been a couple of years and we've done some really fun things and I don't really see my role here ending as I anticipated. That's cool. So augmented intelligence, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? A lot of people, when they talk about AI, they talk about artificial intelligence. And I think like in healthcare, we're just not ready to go there, right? There's just too much data too much information and it's very disparate and it's you know, not very really well understood. So, you know, when you have a problem that's, you know, difficult to understand, it's complex and the data underneath it is in many ways deficient, then, you know, I don't think that AI can really, artificial intelligence can really solve that problem. But what we do need in healthcare is we need that augmented data. So I think of it as, you know, you've got, all this data that, you know, the human mind can't wrap its head around. And, you know, like, how do you bring that data into, like, the context and personalization that is healthcare? Because the problem with, you know, like, there's billions of us on the earth, right? And so you think about it, it's like, there's probably somebody that's like you, except that, you know, like, that's just from a pure biology standpoint. But then, you know, no one really lives in your zip code with the exact same like access to doctors and specialists as you do. So when you think about augmented intelligence, it's bringing those two things together, like the technology and the the data and the AI that can actually help inform humans to make decisions. So augmenting their decision making. I love it. That's awesome. Maybe some of these, and this, I think this applies in some of the areas that, that I've worked with regards to AI and machine learning, which is really in the internet of things space. So you've got these companies that are, have been building physical products for 50 years or so, and that's just the way they've always done it. And they need to sort of rethink their entire business model around services, around sensors, around things that they're normally not really used to dealing with. And so it's a little bit of a of a culture shock and it can actually take a long time for a business to sort of pivot and move into that space. And it sounds like you're saying something similar when it comes to healthcare. Yeah. So in healthcare, it's interesting because we have all these different stakeholders. It's not a widget. It's more that you have all these different incentive systems. So you have healthcare providers who are physicians, nurses, you know, physical therapists, and they are incented to do certain things. And they're incented to kind of look at you in terms of like your condition. Like what's the problem that you have that they can help solve? Your insurance side is the people who are paying the bills and they want to know, you know, how can they keep you healthy? How can they stop you from actually, you know, having to use those services? And then you have your employer who is not really the person receiving their services and they're ultimately the ones who are paying for it. So you just have all of these different stakeholders that have, like different lenses that they use to look at your healthcare delivery. And so then they generate very different types of information. It's a shock when somebody from the provider side comes into the insurance side of the house and sees what type of data that lives there. And then it's a shock from like, say, somebody who's doing basic science in pharmaceutical research comes into like the hospital and sees what data is there or into an insurance company. So we're all like looking at data, but in different ways. And like the data is being used with different end results. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, everyone's driven by their own motivation, I guess, depending on which side of the fence they're sitting on. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't really 
sort of thought through that. So as an institute, are you trying to provide, like, like what's the output? Are you providing like tools? Are you providing a collaboration opportunities? What, where are you guys in this? So it took us a couple of years to sort of like find our reason for being. And I think <laughs> that real reason is, you know, like I said, being able to take different types of data computing and marrying it to your human expertise and what that results in or what we want that to result in is a community. Because yes, you have the technology, but it's really about who is in this space, who can share and build upon each other's work. So we've got a couple of things that we've done. One is we have this third coast augmented intelligence for health poll which is incentivizing student teams to come in and come up with solutions for, you know, health disparity using healthcare data. And that's a six month long competition in which we're nurturing these student teams through and kind of showing them things around, you know, healthcare data bias, ethics, and cybersecurity, all these things that I wish I'd known when I was just starting in this space. And we want to provide for the student as they're starting out. And then this other aspect of what we're trying to build up is we want to create a health data gymnasium, which marries the people expertise uh, with the data sets that are available in healthcare and the tools. And then, you know, just like the word gymnasium implies, it's a training ground, right? You know, you're probably very skilled in AI, but if I asked you to, you know, write a bunch of algorithms for healthcare, you wouldn't really know, like, what kind of data would you go after? Why would you go after this data versus the other data? So like trying to bring in like what I call data Sherpas to help you figure out where best to to point, you know, your technology at. That's sort of the the role of the gymnasium is to be that bridge builder. That's exciting. That's that's really, really cool. So I guess what are some some examples? I know I think when you and I sort of talked talked offline, I think you're talking about ethics, I guess, like specifically, there were some examples I know that was like, wow, I hadn't even thought about it that way. Yeah. So one example is, you know, you think about a population of patients or individuals, right? And if you have like a thousand people out of those thousand people, say 600 of those people actually have some kind of medical symptoms and some subset, maybe like 300 of them will end up saying, oh, I I think I'm going to go to either my doctors or, you know, an immediate care. Out of like that thousand, less than 1% of those people will end up going to an academic medical center for their care. And, you know, like the, the perspective that I want people to think about is that's where we're collecting the data for clinical studies. In 2020, there was a JAMA article, the Journal of the American Medical Association. They basically said that, you know, out of all of these algorithms, that clinical algorithms that we use, most of those were taking place in like the East or the West Coast. I think it was like 34 states were not even represented. So wow. states like Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, states where you think about where is the health disparity is in those very states. And yet we're creating these algorithms based on data that's not even in those states. That's crazy. Yeah, you're only looking at pretty much the half of the data or it sounds like a very, very different weighted version you know, of it. Yeah. So people that live in those states aren't even being represented in any of these situations. Well, and it's not intentional, right? You know, a lot of times what happens in the bias is that people get access to data and they are answering a question and they go and get data that's easy to get. They're not necessarily even thinking, oh, well, you know, like, where's that data being collected? You know, is it being collected in a medical center? Is that representational of like the people that are actually going to get sick? And so I think that in the last, I would say, 10 or so years, I feel like we are trying to be more intentional about where we're collecting data. So there are definitely, there's an Alzheimer's cohort up in Wisconsin where they've intentionally gone out and recruited people who have a family history of Alzheimer's and trying really hard to be broad in who they get data from, not just the people who happen to be coming in the doors of academic medical centers. Yeah. I mean, how can people participate? I know there's, and, and I'll, I'll include these in the liner notes and stuff like that as well, but people want to be a part of the data gymnasium. I know there's, you've got websites and stuff set up, right? We have a website called Health Data Gym. We've got, you know, ways to get in touch with us there. And on that website, we have a small curated list of data sets that we've worked with, which we think are good data sets. Right now, we just have a list of tools, but eventually we will have sort of a sandbox space to allow people to play with the data. 
That's interesting. Yeah. So if, if people are, you, you're obviously looking for other people to contribute data as well. Are you trying to create just an overall repository here? Is that kind of what your vision is in the coming years? We want people to provide data that's realistic, but that, you know, other people can play with. And, you know, eventually there'll be some data that's behind a firewall that researchers can get access to. But our first mission is to try to get it out there for an educational perspective, because frankly, most of uh, the people that are working in this data field, like myself, we kind of fell into this space. It wasn't intentional. And so my bigger picture for where the Institute needs to go is to eventually create this health data gymnasium and then reach out to groups like, you know, that are historically underrepresented as well as underprivileged and, you know, create a natural progression for them to get into working in the health data field. Because I don't know about you, but everybody I know who is working in data today, they have like a PhD and 10 to 15 years of healthcare experience. And I always ask people, I'm like, who do you think has a PhD and 10 to 15 years of healthcare experience, right? They're definitely not diverse. I mean, as much as I love working with them, the reason why they are that way is because right now, everything that we do in healthcare data and AI is so bespoke. We haven't yet created what I would call like the open source of healthcare data yet. Why do you think that is? I guess, are, are people afraid to share it? Is, are there regulations and stuff around it? Do we just not have the data? Have we not looked deep enough? We have more data in healthcare. It's an embarrassment of riches, right? The problem is that it's who has traditionally claimed ownership of that data. So in the past, you know, for instance, your clinical data, the data about like what gets done to you and how you're diagnosed gets held with the providers or with your doctor's offices, with your hospital. And we haven't had any incentive to share that data because it's kind of like, you know, the gap sharing with, I don't know, (laughs) some other retailer. Sure. Like their customer data, you know, like that's kind of how they viewed it. It's my data. I did stuff to you and I want you to come back. So I'm not going to share it. And on the insurance side of the house, they've had these gang rule contracts with these providers that say, you know, you're not allowed to share this data outside of like what we do, health plan operations. And in recent years, you know, kind of in the waning days of the Obama administration, there was a bill called 21st Century Cures Act, which was trying to free up both healthcare research as well as, you know, data itself. So there's a a line in it that says that Patients shall have access to their data at no additional cost or no additional effort. And what that meant is like we can now make rules around giving people access to their data. And so then the ownership of the data is with you and I, and then they'll get to be the ones who provide data to research and to like other uses. Interesting. Yeah, I was not aware of that. So so at the end of the day, I own my own data, all the prescriptions I take or whatever it is, all the physicals I've done, whatever. And then it's up to me to basically say, yep, I'm okay with you sharing this publicly. Do you still think people are are worried about sharing that, right? I think if you went to the general population and said, your data is now going to be open sourced if you want to have it be uh, like a part of that, do you sense some public worry in that? I think that probably the most recent worries that I've seen have to do with the recent DOPS decision. We don't have a national privacy law. Our privacy is regulated at the different state level. So for those of us in healthcare, it's been not fun to, you know, like have to figure out, oh, well, I can't share mental health data, you know, for anybody over 14 in this state, but I can in this state, right? So by removing, by not having a consistent national statute around privacy, and then now you've got different states making different regulations about, you know, abortion and who has access to it. I think that there is going to be, we're going to have to figure out how to manage people's privacy and how they share data. And really, one of my hopes is that we really work to anonymize data, um, create synthetic data. I think those are some of the ways that we can kind of still use data to further research without endangering patients themselves. Yeah, I guess that's what I was going to say as a follow-up was maybe people don't understand, but your data is anonymized. Like they don't really know that it's Justin who has all this, all these conditions, for example, or whatever that has gone to the doctor for X, Y, or Z. They just know that somebody did and maybe they'd be a little bit more comfortable. I just think a lot of people seem to be, well, in some cases, I think overly paranoid, but that's, that's just my 
per- perspective and they don't maybe understand sort of how it works because uh, I would say in general, most people aren't data analysts, right? They just, they hear my information is now going to be out on the internet. Well, that's a, that's a non-starter for me. Well, even some of the basic information that you would think, gee, don't your you people in healthcare have good access to this? Like who are all of the physicians and what are they, what are their different licenses? Are they allowed to practice across state lines? All those things. We don't really have a good handle on it because we've got this system that you know, we have multiple insurance payers who contract mm. separately with these various doctors and they're all holding their own records and they're all held responsible for the accuracy of that record. But that's still way too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, I think they're probably all vectors or targets for people to be attacking anyway. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. If you have all this stuff managed in multiple areas, you, you, it's hard to have one law or one regulation making sure that everyone is following best practices in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's this is cool. So you, so you and the other people at the institute there are sort of thinking about how how you can sort of bring this data to bear together, I guess, and then work with students and teams to start thinking about new and creative ways in which you can solve some healthcare the current healthcare challenges that we have today. Is that an effective way of sort of summarizing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, we're only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of trying to put that data and the tools in front of people. I would say there's other people working in this space that I'm really fascinated with. So there's people working around like machine intelligence safety, for instance. We have a new institute that was just created at Northwestern, like in a broader sense about, gee, like as we figure out machine intelligence, how do we make it safe? I think that that's fascinating, right? Like, just kind of think about this idea of like people not wanting to share data. What if they didn't have to? What if you had a, you know, multi-party computing where you don't have to share your data, but you share your results and that those queries can cross different platforms and you can still do research, but you're not exposing that data by moving it across uh, different organizations. Feels like maybe there's some blockchain. There could be some blockchain applications as there as you were sort of talking through that. That's what kind of popped in my head. Yeah, I think blockchain would be a great application to use for for consent. I think a lot about, you know, there are situations in which you want to be able to a- allow different parties to know who has who should have access to your data. But, you know, there are other times when you want to be able to immediately release that access, say a divorce situation, for instance, you know, one minute somebody is, you know, your emergency contact and the next minute it's the last person you want anybody to call, right? Right. I don't think blockchain is going to solve everything. I think originally when blockchain came out, we talked about it as, hey, let's put the entire electronic health record on blockchain. Well, that's a lot of data. Blockchain is like, is really expensive in terms of processing and compute. So, we don't necessarily want to do that, but I think it's it's right for something like consent. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And just the whole idea of a distributed computing model in some ways that, you know, there isn't, there is not one, one general central organizer that holds all that information, right? That's sort of the beauty of it, I guess, is that it's sort of spread within the network. Yeah, and there's a lot of distrust across the healthcare spectrum. And so that's kind of the other problem, I think, that blockchain is trying to solve for is these computable contracts of, you know, parties that don't necessarily trust each other, but still have to work together. Sure, for sure. Yeah. I, I want to work with you, but stay at arm's length, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is the day in life for you, I guess, as you're working with, with this organization? Well, so my role is generally on the side of talking to people like you, finding, you know, that network of folks who are working in this space companies, sometimes they're startup companies, sometimes they're companies that are looking to innovate and trying to essentially be the matchmaker between people who have a problem that they need to be solved and people who have the resources to solve that problem. At the end of the day, you know, like I joke a lot that I do a lot of hustling. So I also do a lot of fundraising for the Institute as well. And just, you know, it's really about community building, which I know you know a lot about. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah, no, we can't make an impact on the world alone, right? It, it really does take a village, I think. And the best ideas come when you collaborate, work work with a bunch of different people, generate sort of a one plus one equals three scenario. 
Are you guys publicly funded or are you funded through grants or how, how does that work? We are funded by Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. And we kind of, you know, when it was launched, we had initial funding for like the first three years to say, see if we can make something of ourselves. And so we're kind of into year three now. And it looks like we're going to, we've definitely made a name for ourselves. And, you know, we're going to get be getting some faculty members as well. And just trying to create a bigger footprint at Northwestern. That's cool. You probably think back, wow, you know, two years ago, I'd never really thought I would have been doing this, right? Like I said, I thought I was going to do sort of this volunteer thing for about six months. So come a, a long way from there. Yeah, that's a great story. It's a great story. So one of the things I do like to talk to people about that have kind of, you know, gotten to a certain point in their career, sort of have a chance to look back and see how they got to where, where they're at. I mean, what sort of advice would you give anybody maybe wanting to break into this into this space or coming out of school and kind of has a little bit of an interest in this? Where, where do you think they should probably go? You know, the problem with where I am is that most people I know, either they're physicians who are practicing or doing research and go, wow, there must be a better way to do this. Or they're on the insurance side, say they're like a statistician and they say, well, you know, like there's there's a wider world beyond this than just in the health insurance space, for instance. So there aren't really programs that I know of, but there are professional organizations that kind of feed into it. And so, you know, AHEP, which is the America's Health Insurance Plans, has a bunch of educational material that I think is really good. If you're interested in the insurance side of things, there is American College of Health care executives that also has a lot of this curriculum around the healthcare system. And then there's HIMSS, which is, you know, another organization. Their conference, if you get a chance to go, it's probably, it's huge. You know, every year, it used to be a McCormick place in Chicago, and then it grew too big for that. And now it's, I think, either Orlando or Vegas. Everybody who works in the space shows up there some at some point. Also, ONC and CMS. ONC is the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology that's out of the government. And CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so I think there's a lot of places where this information resides, but there's really no great framework for people to get into the space yet, which is what the Health Data Gymnasium is trying to solve. We want to create a bunch of materials for people, whether it's links to other sites or material that we create that help them to get into different levels of healthcare data. Wow, this is this is great. This is great. I know, you know, having you reach out, I guess, and and I, yeah, I would say a participate in these in these conferences is great. I want to get you to attend one of our Applied AI conferences and and speak there. But even just one of our meetups too, you know, as well. We we meet the first Thursday of the month, and so I know you and I are kind of working on a schedule to get you to sort of present and talk there. You know, are, are there any other topics or things that maybe I didn't cover that you'd like to? share, I guess, with the with the listeners? We sort of touched upon it, but I want to be a little bit more explicit in that for a long time, people haven't had ready access to their own healthcare data. You know, especially if you are somebody who's dealt with a complex medical condition, whether you've had cancer or some other chronic disease, you know that in order to go to the next specialist, you basically have to carry around binders full of your own information. And, you know, the regulations have been changing in the last, you know, five or six years where now both your insurance payer as well as soon to be your hospital health system have to be able to provide for you your data in an API format that is in a fire standard format. And so that what that opens the door for is different apps to be built that allow you to, to use that data however you need to use it. And so I think like what, I guess the message, what, what I'm trying to say with everybody is that you now have the power that you didn't have before. You don't have to go to the basement of like a hospital and try to make photocopies of your health record. Like they have to give it to you and they have to give it in a format that you can ingest. And so I think that's huge. And and not, not everybody can appreciate that, but people who are dealing with complex medical issues, that's something that they, they should know that they have access to. 
I was not aware of that. Does that now provide, I guess, startups or entrepreneurial business opportunities for people to sort of start building these apps? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of different apps that are out there. My current favorite, although it is really targeted towards specific complex medical conditions, is a company called Citizen. They're now bought by another company, but called Invite, who does genetic testing. But just imagine if you had all your health records and you also had your genetic data pulled together. And I'm not affiliated with them, so I'm not trying to say any, like, endorse them in any way. But I just think this idea of being able to go and get your data and also, you know, marry it to your, your genetic data and be able to take that to your physician. I think the next part of applied AI that I'd like to see is have the artificial intelligence synthesize that data in a meaningful way for you and your physician. And, you know, like, I think I heard it on your podcast with Neil Sahota, who was talking about, you know, this AI bot. And wouldn't it be great if that AI bot understood you, your data, your family history, and was able to synthesize all that data for you? Wow. That'd be amazing. I mean, the, I, I think one of the powers of, well, a, a couple of different thoughts. Number one is the powers of APIs, you know, really allow you to create sort of this, this mashup, right? Sort of where you're mashing up all, all these, ver- these various data or information things to, to create something that is, you know, new and unique. And then what's, what is really cool to me is that, yeah, the power of AI now is, you know, you can apply in t- a t- intelligence, I guess, that more than one doctor would have, right? You could bring a lot of different, I guess, knowledge to this data. So it's not just one doctor having to take a look at it. You can sort of create a, a model or a power in numbers, I guess, to allow you to, yeah, again, eventually sort of act on it using this augmented idea. I, I really love love your augmented concept. So yeah, that, that to me is sort of fascinating, right? That we'd be able to, and that's probably what your, what your, what your ultimate goal is, I guess, yeah. right? At the Institute. That's our ultimate goal is, you know, to actually use data to augment human intelligence. And we have a ways to go, but there's there's so much new data and new technologies that are being developed. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, cool. Well, Nan, how do people reach out to you? So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to, to reach me. Well, good, good, good. Cool. Yeah, like we'll, we'll be sure to put your LinkedIn information and your Twitter handle in the show notes here on the Applied AI podcast. And again, like I said, I look forward to having you potentially here in a future month, having you present at one of our meetups. Because yeah, I think this is information that a lot of people need need to learn about. I, I certainly learned a ton here over the past uh, 35 minutes or so, as you and I have been talking about what is happening with my data. And I, probably in a lot of, I guess a lot of people aren't even in the space. So they're, they're just not really aware of of even what's possible with, the, with these new technologies. There's a lot of things possible there's also a lot of false starts. And so if you look at the history of AI and health, there's been a lot of money thrown at it. Uh, and I think with the intention that, wow, we have all these really smart people and smart technology, surely we can solve healthcare. And, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, it, that's not enough. You really need the healthcare expertise. You need the people who had to do it from scratch, not just with a bunch of technology and a bunch of money, but like really had to work on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, somebody needs to understand sort of the, the core problem, I guess, at its root, sort of be the subject matter expert. And, yeah. And, and create a collaborative space for everyone to, to sort of like, yeah, learn like learn from each other and, and build the best solution possible. That's exactly well, what we're trying to do. That's great, that's great, Nan. Well, I appreciate you for all the work that you do. Hopefully things go well here in the coming year and wanna have you back here and, we can have like an update in a future episode to hear how things are going. So thank you so much for your time today and, and sharing the story and everything you've been doing. Great. And I love your podcast. I learn a lot from it. So thank you for having me. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.